Hey everybody, what's going on? Welcome to episode 13. I think I put 14 in some of the threads because I just forgot we didn't have one last week. But episode 13 of Climbing the Ladder. I'm uh, your host, Chairman V, and coasting with me as always is John Clark from CSN. What's going on, John? Uh, busy, busy. <laughs> as always, right? Yes. Well, today, guys, we got two special, special guests. Um, you know, I know last week we didn't have a show, so uh, because uh, a, f a few people had canceled last minute, so we didn't. Unfortunately, we couldn't have the show, but uh, we're going to make up for it this week. And uh, first off, we have from uh, Fanatic, the general manager of Fanatic, actually, Elroy Pinto. Hey, Elroy, how's it Hi. going? From good, good. From um, London too, so we appreciate yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> It's good, be on, it's good to be on the show over here. Um, looking forward to what we're going to discuss and stuff like that. Uh, thanks for having me on once again. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, lots of good topics today, so it should be, <coughs> um, you know, yeah. should be lots of great discussion. And uh, secondly, we have none other than Jeff Johnston, a.k.a. Check 6 Maximus Black. How's it going, big boss? <laughs> it's going good, man. It's going good. Thanks for having me on another one of your shows. I appreciate it, and... Uh, I look forward to all the topics as well, as well as some a lot of good stuff that's uh, going to be talked about here. Hey, yeah. before we go any farther, mm -hmm. did he say that right? No, I didn't. I don't have a dang Canadian accent. It's it's oh, it's it's Baus. Baus. It's Baus. 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 We got to make sure Baus. we say that. I mean, if I'm going to say it, I might as well say it right, right? That's right. He's that's the right. boss, Baus. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I like to <laughs> refer to him, right? But yeah, okay. So um, you know, I. You, I just kind of want to get a sense of what you guys have been up to. I mean, what, just before we just kind of dive into these topics, um, uh, you know, just what have you guys been doing lately, or what, what any any big events you guys are going to be at next? Elroy, how about you? Me. Uh, well, actually, at, as of now, no. That's mostly because of uh, visa issues that tend to creep up for me from time to time. Oh yeah. Um, but maybe I, I might be I might be present at DreamHack or maybe Gamescom in the coming weeks. But I think most likely DreamHack winter seems seems the most likely for me. Yeah. Okay, great. How about you, Jeff? Uh, actually, yeah, I've been working with uh, with CSN and John here for the last couple of days. I'm going to be uh, flying into Dallas, Texas for QuakeCon uh, August 1st. I'm going to be hosting a big live stream event that's going to happen on my stream, and uh, just meeting the fans, hanging out, giving away some good stuff, and just having a good time. So I think that's like the major thing that I'm working on right now. Yeah, you know, we're definitely going to be talking about uh, the QuakeCon and the, the kind of fundraiser slash Kickstarter that, um, that you and CSN are definitely working on right now. But we will get to that in a second. <laughs> but before we do that, we, uh, we always like to start off uh, the show with, with kind of uh, this, this topic that we, we call misconceptions. And what we, ha what we do is we have the guest um, bring up any kind of misconceptions they think are prevalent in the industry right now that you know they think they can you know probably clear they they want to clear up so uh, you know p particularly you Elroy being in you know kind of team management and Jeff you you being personality slash um, you know founder of you know just just like TV right um, are there any kind of misconceptions you guys want to talk about right now that you know just the community just has wrong right now uh, do you want to go Jeff or um, I guess, yeah. Uh, okay. mis misconceptions as in just in general of esports or sort of what happens? Uh, you know, particularly, I mean, it can be in general esports, but, you know, particularly in your case, you know, are, is there anything that, you know, do folks just think that, you know, this is kind of a generalization, this isn't, you know, this, this is not, this is definitely not the case, but do people just think, you know, you just goof around and, you know, you just, you're just streaming and just happen to have like a ton of, you know, viewers or, you know, that type of thing, you know what I mean? Um, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, I can't speak for other channels, but I guess I can speak on my experiences. That uh, a lot of fans, uh, I guess, in the start, not so much now. Um, we've sort of educated them a little bit, and they've uh, they've hung around me for long enough to know what really goes on. But I think uh, a lot of the community, when it comes to starting a, a YouTube channel and and really branding yourself, it takes a lot of work. Um, even my, I guess, I can start with misconceptions with my my parents being one. Um, first and foremost, I want to let everybody out there know that <coughs> becoming a, a, um, an esports personality or quitting your job to do esports or anything like that, I, I do not recommend uh, for a number of reasons. One, it's extremely hard to make it. Uh, two, you really have to sort of do it because you love it and not try to do it to make money. Uh, and that's where a lot of people fall short. And I, I've even noticed a lot of people sort of fall off the wagon when 
they have love for what they do, and then the money starts to get in, to get involved, and then they start changing who they are to sort of produce content and, and make money. Um, and a lot of people think that people are just swimming in dough. Uh, that's not really how it works. And in order to, and I'm sure Elroy can can talk a lot about what it's like to to run a team and and how to make money and sponsorships and all that stuff. It's not easy. There's a lot of groundwork that is in, that is involved. Um, People just think that you can just start up a channel, and next thing you know, it you're you're on the front page of Reddit, and you've got your own show, and right. and you're joining pro teams and stuff like that. But there's a lot of hard work that's involved. I mean, when I first started Lag TV with my with my partner Adam, uh, we did it because we love it, and we still do. And I think that's the reason why uh, we're still successful today is because people realize how much fun we're having, and we stayed true to who we were. I mean, we've made some mistakes along the way, of course, but. It's um, it's a lot of work. I mean, I when I when I was first starting out, I was working as a server and I was working a full time job, forty hours a week. And in order for me to make the amount of money I was making as a server in esports, I had to work four times the amount. So if I was working like you know ten hours, I had to work forty hours in esports in order to make the same amount of money I was making at a ten hour job. Just because you know you don't get paid a whole lot of money uh, in YouTube. It, you really have to have uh, a lot of views to do so. I, I say right now we're doing fairly well uh, just because we like to stay fresh and we're doing something that nobody else is doing. And that's why I think a, a lot of YouTubers now, uh, I'm not going to say any names, but a, a lot of YouTubers that were, were having high number of views are starting to slowly decline uh, because, for one, Twitch TV and uh, OWN and stuff, a lot of people are starting to really love the live experience uh, than what they are to watch YouTube videos. So um, I guess that's sort of one misconception that people think that you know teams and players are just rolling in money unless you're at the very top of the top. It's really tough. And I mean, even still, I think it's a little bit easier on myself being a personality and someone that's branded my name uh, that I don't have to rely on a team paying me or me having to win a, a championship. And that's a lot of pressures are on players because if they don't perform... Uh, they don't get paid. I mean, teams will pay, pay them a salary depending on who they are and what they do and, and their track record. But for the most part, you know, you don't win. You're, you're slowly dying unless you really connect with your fans and you can make money from Twitch TV or, or YouTube or uh, different other uh, various sponsorships um, that you have. So uh, I, I have a, a up, the utmost respect for players because they're, they must be under some serious pressure if they don't perform. I see. Yeah, I mean, not not all of them are required to get results, though. Well, that's, uh, good. that's what I mean, and that's what he was alluding to with the whole, yeah. you know, uh, really getting connected with your fans and becoming a personality too, right? Um, so, Elroy, how about you? Do you have any misconceptions? Oh, misconceptions. Um, oh, I love the I sigh. Think <laughs> I think um, here it comes. I think, <laughs> I think I'm gonna have to sit down and maybe write a book about this. But I think <laughs> oh, uh, really? Jeff sort of basically. Um, summed a lot of it up really well. Um, I do think, honestly, that a lot of people think that being a manager, uh, you know, is something that's that's fairly easy. And one of the things which which leads on that is that you have a lot of people who claim to be managers, um, who, you know, a lot of a lot of people who don't really have the experience. But what is a manager in that case, uh, or what is this? A, a writer in esports or something. It's at the at the core. It's still a person who's really passionate about what they do. Um, and for someone to sort of um, work really hard on this and to sort of develop themselves is it's not something everyone gets to see. So as a result, you always have you know for a player, it's far easier to sort of develop and show that you know either by streaming or by going to a LAN event. But it's really hard to sort of. It, when you work behind the scenes, when you work in management, you don't obviously get get the loving from the community most of the time. Um, you tend to just be a silent person because at the end of the day, it also, it also depends how you view the organization. For example, for me with Fnatic, I always believe that no, no individual is, is bigger than the team. It's because um, you're ha when you join an organization, especially with Fnatic, we always... We always highly value our players, but I also think that we've we don't li we don't like we don't like to believe we like to believe that we have not uh, bend over for players just because you know we want to pander to their tastes or their specific needs or something. Mind you, there have been players with 
with very special needs from time to time. Um, so I think that I think for all the people who work behind the scenes, honestly, people like uh, people like myself, uh, you, you know, um, who maybe don't have a show or something. You know, even even Jeff, you know, he's he streams pretty often, and you know that's really good for really good for him that he gets he gets the views and stuff like that. Um, sometimes I think it do it it does sting somewhere that you don't get the kind of recognition that. Uh, say a professional player does, or someone who seems really often, or like a personality in that sense. Um, but I think that, you know, at the end of the day, when you see when you see any of your squads winning, and this, mind you, in Fnatic, I don't look after every team. I just look after Starcraft 2 and maybe Dota 2. But yeah, it, 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 it's sort of, you know, you you have this feeling where if the guys win at LAN at like Dreamhack, and I'm not even there, it's it's something that bonds. Bonds everyone together, and I think that that feeling is is really worth it, honestly. So, um, so yeah, that, I mean, that, that's that's all I would like to just say about it. I wouldn't want to address greater misconceptions, but I think I just wanted to share that. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, th I think that that feeling of team is, I think, one thing that. Uh, you know, is is missing from some teams sometimes. You know, especially now that that uh, you know teams are getting more sponsors and there's definitely more money on the table now. Uh, you kind of lose that kind of, I guess, kinship. You know that, like like you said, you know, managers feel you know so invested that you know when the players win, they you know they feel like they had a big part of it, which they did. They had a big part of it in doing it, right? I mean, a lot of the folks that do all the the behind the scenes things, you know, they have a lot to do with these players' success too because they handle all the things that that. You know, players that don't have these managers doing have to do, and that actually affects their their play and their practice and that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I find it I find it pretty sad sometimes to see uh, a lot of not even just fans, but even media and and everything that's revolved around the players when they win a championship or they do really well is they don't really the the managers and the people behind the scenes don't really get the credit that they deserve as well. And I, I talked about it a little bit. He said it, you know, it kind of stings. Uh, just a little bit, and it's like that. I guess in any any form of life, you know, whenever someone um, major in in uh, society does something great for for the world or whatever, uh, a lot of the time is uh, the teachers that, that taught him the things that he learned uh, are sometimes not acknowledged uh, and and sort of you know made that path for that that person or that player to shine. And uh, I think you know a lot of media and stuff need to start paying attention to a lot of people that are doing things behind the scenes because they're just as important and sometimes even more important. Yeah, exactly. Which, which kind of brings up the point. I'm just going to bring it up right now. Screw brainstorming. But but Jeff, Jeff was just talking about offline. Like you know, we we should have a. You know, why don't you actually explain it, Jeff? The whole awards thing. Yeah, sure. um, this has been something that I've been thinking about for a really long time, and uh, I, I think that somebody needs to hit us up with a collab or something. I'll host it. I don't care. Uh, but I think we need to do an <laughs> esports award show. Uh, I think it would be great. Uh, having all the greatest players around the world uh, meet in one, you know, stadium or convention center, uh, and give awards to players, not only players, team managers, people behind the scenes, you know, sound guys, production, all that great stuff. I think it would be great for the fans. I think it would be great for sponsorships and uh, and a, a great place for everybody to sort of get together and uh, give each other a pat on the back and, and recognize some individuals that necessarily wouldn't be recognized in the first place. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be an awesome, awesome idea. Not to mention, you know, just having everybody in the same room. I mean, <laughs> lots of people, you know, networking, and that just usually what that means is just even better projects, you know, in the future, and you know, just more collaboration, right? Yeah, that'd be awesome. Anybody out there? Let's make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> Please. But, all right. Why don't we uh, kind of segment into kind of the topics that we had <laughs> planned for today? And um, for viewers, what we what we kind of do is we we have topics that are are angled towards either Jeff or, or Elroy, and we'll start off with, uh, with um, topics that are for Jeff, And uh, but that doesn't mean Elroy's going to sit here quiet the whole time, okay? Like, I mean, we're, we're, it's basically, we introduce a topic, and probably Jeff will speak to it, and then, you know, it's pretty much open discussion between, you know, myself, John, Elroy, and Jeff, um, and then we'll, you know, we'll switch over to Elroy kind of uh, in, at, at some point. Uh, but first off, Jeff, you know, a lot of folks, you know, obviously seen your stream, they know, you know, They've you know they probably checked out what you're you know currently doing, but they really don't have like a history of of kind of how you've led up to this right uh, to the point where you you've gotten. So uh, why don't, if you don't mind, can you can you give us just a really brief history of um, I guess you know your your, your uh, experience in esports and you know just really everything like all your YouTube channels and everything kind of leading up to um, you know every, w what you have now. 
Yeah, sure. Um, I've already talked about the whole server thing, uh, so I won't get back into that. And uh, when I when I first made my when I when we first got YouTube partnership, which happened around I think five or six thousand subscribers on YouTube, um, and I got my first paycheck from YouTube, which was really not a lot of money. And considering uh, myself and Adam, uh, we have to like split it fifty fifty. It really wasn't a lot of money. But when you first make money off something that you absolutely love and you have a passion for, uh, you just get instantly hooked. And I was so hooked on everything about it. I was, I was hooked on the attention that I got. I was hooked on creating good content. Um, the fact that, I, that StarCraft II, to me, is just the greatest thing ever made. Uh, so all those factors were, were just going through. And I had such a great partner, Adam, that uh, was you know, by my side the whole time. Uh, and we've really complimented each other very nicely. He's got a, a degree in business, so he, he did a lot of the, you know, the legal stuff and uh, was working on sort of the logistics of everything. And I was sort of the guy that was just super creative, and I just wanted to get out there. Um, I made some mistakes along the way. Uh, I burned a couple of bridges on the way up. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to lie, I spammed everywhere about Lag TV. I was really mm -hmm. excited, um, a lot pissed off a lot of people, but I don't regret anything because, you know, sometimes you got to do extreme things. It's like uh, a necessary evil. Uh, like I said before, it's really, really tough getting your name out there, and you got to network as much as you can. Um, so that, that's really what I did. Once, once Lag TV started to grow, we, we actually uh, casted a game, and I had posted on Reddit for the very first time, and, I, and it was a, a game where somebody failed and cheeses and I, I posted and I said when cheese fails 101 and somebody in the comments said you know this would be really great for for a season and it just dawned on me I'm like wow you know that's a great idea so that sort of became the start of when cheese fails and my career because without I, I think without when cheese fails I, I wouldn't be where I'm at today and that's sort of the big show that we run once a week, and it's been huge. I mean, the the views go anywhere from you know one and a half million to you know a hundred thousand. They're they're really something, and we have a lot of fun. Um, we we really had to sort of do something that nobody else was doing. And what we do is we only create uh, content from the fans. So if you're bronze, silver, gold, platinum, diamond, master, we really don't do any pro coverage whatsoever because it was such a saturated. Um, there's just so much of it out there that right. we wanted to, to, to be different in some way and, and have comedy. And to be perfectly honest, we, don't, we didn't really know anything about StarCraft. I mean, we were casting and just talking out of our ass, really. And we, were really <laughs> we were just making things up as we were going along and learning the game together. And uh, you know, we still do that to an extent today, but I, I like to think we, we now understand the game a lot more. Um, so that was sort of the whole leg TV starting. And then... From there, you know, Adam has a, a degree in business, and uh, he wants to do a career in marketing. So I wanted to do eSports, and I dropped at a university. And to be perfectly honest, you know, I don't have a whole lot going for me. So I was like, you know what, Adam, I'm going to really try to, uh, to brand myself and go for it. And he's been super supportive. You know, I started my own live stream, and uh, from there I've just been so... Um, you know, 40, 60, 80 hour weeks, whatever it takes to sort of build an audience and connect with my fan base. And then from there, I started doing other games and creating other YouTube channels because in order to have longevity in esports, you sort of have to have your hands in multiple things because uh, one day you're relevant and the next day you're not. So, mm -hmm. you know, I have to be really realistic and think, you know, if I suddenly die in StarCraft two years from now, maybe I'll be, you know, maybe I'll have a spot in a different game or just as a personality in general to maybe cast esports or uh, play another game or do whatever I can. So I've been really branding myself that way. Uh, and just recently, you know, with some of my success, I've got on Check6 uh, Pro Team and uh, they've been helping me out. I recently got featured on Team Liquid a couple months ago and that obviously helped out my numbers quite a bit. Uh, but I think uh, a, a lot of people, a lot of casters and a lot of players out there, I know up front it may seem like a waste of time to create a stream and really connect with your fans on a level uh, and be their friend. But in, in the long term, you know, if you, if you really appreciate your fan base, they're going to do a lot for you. And I have nothing but great things to say uh, about my fans, and they've definitely gotten me to the place I am today, and I'm forever grateful. And I would, I would rather die in esports 
um, doing what I love and staying true to who I am than succeed and become a sellout. So mm -hmm. if it takes me, you know, three more years to, you know, get at a day nine or a total biscuit level um, of, of success, even though I could never mimic or do what they do, but sort of, you know, be in their position, then uh, I'll wait three to five years. But if it means you know, I have to do something I don't want to do to get there tomorrow, I'm, I'm never going to do it. Jeff, what do you think the makeup of your friend uh, of your your fans are? Do you think a lot of them are StarCraft two two fans, or are they just fans of you? I, I like to think they're fans of me. Um, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, let's face it, I'm not a very good StarCraft player. I am on a pro team, but for obvious reasons, uh, networking capabilities, popularity, not so much me being a player. Uh, I'm a top eight master player. Uh, I'm I'm working on my on my skill now, but. I have a lot of pro players ask me. Some are angry. Some are, some legitimately say, you know, how the hell do you get 2,000 concurrent viewers on your Twitch TV, uh, and I only get 50. And I simply tell them that you have to have a relationship with your with your fans. They don't care if I'm winning or losing. Uh, they just care that I'm having a good time, and and all I care is that they're having a good time. And is I like to think of it as. I'm hanging out with them, we're playing video games together as if I were to call Adam over and come over to my house and we're just screwing around and playing video games. I like to bring that experience to them as well. It's a hangout session. It's a, it's a let's, let's be friends and chill. That's the thing. This isn't a, I'm going to sit here at my 400 APM and run ads. Um, <laughs> it's, it's an experience and it's a friendship. And I, and I think that's, I like to believe that's why they're there. I'm, sh I'm sure a lot of them... I uh, love StarCraft, and I think that's a bonus, but I think no matter what game I play, uh, they'll back me up for it. Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely one thing I've noticed, you know, with your, your viewers and your following is that, you know, they're really, really loyal, you know what I mean? And, and I guess, have you, do you have the analytics on your side to know, like, I guess how many, I guess, return uh, viewers you have, like, you know, I guess a on average, or... Do you have that kind of data, or? Um, um, on, yeah, on a regular on a regular day, I get about twenty thousand unique visitors on my stream. Uh -huh. uh, we get between all of my YouTube channels and stuff, it's around one hundred and fifty thousand views. Nice. Uh, five percent is uh, five percent is a female. Uh, the majority is eighteen to twenty two, I think, <laughs> and then uh, there is the there is another margin between like twenty two and twenty eight, which is a good percent as, as well. Uh, but a, a lot of I have a lot of returning fans. You know, when, when they're when they've made that commitment to join the fellowship, uh, they stick around and be part of the uh, of the of the entire experience for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, you you definitely spoke a lot about, uh, or you just you know mentioned that some players come up to you and ask you like, you know, what are some things that you know that can I can do to I, I guess get more viewers, right? Um, the fact that players are asking you, that, you know, in the player and some teams, I guess, want their players to, you know, to kind of do the same thing, right? I mean, there's a lot of folks, like, you know, the EG folks, right, stream all the time. Uh, Elroy, you know, one thing I noticed about Fnatic is that your players don't tend to stream very often, right? Um, mm -hmm. What is your take on, on that? The, you know, just um, connecting with the, uh, the viewers and that kind of thing. I think it's... Uh, I think when we had the previous team with uh, Kawhi Rice and TT1 um, and Phoenix, for example, and Sen as well, mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of focus on actually getting players to sort of uh, to sort of stream and talk about uh, you know and to basically do their thing on ladder. But with the Koreans, it's obviously um, I wouldn't say a little more; it's a lot more difficult. Um, Mostly because uh, it's the way they, it's the way people view streaming. So obviously in the West, uh, you know, a lot of people tend to, a lot of players as well tend to view it as sort of like this viable income slash interacting with my fans. Uh, whereas for the Koreans, they 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 think that it sort of takes away from their their practice. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes away from you know what kind of um, builds they could sort of experiment with on ladder. Um, we obviously uh, we obviously respect this that uh, we want the guys to stream obviously, uh, but we also want to sort of respect the fact that you know not all of them are uh, very sort of outgoing even on stream. <laughs> obviously language limitations you know. For example, if a, if a Korean streams, he needs to at least uh, be willing to sort of talk to his fans. Uh, while we have Moon streaming from time to time, um, he's just m mostly interested in just streaming his games. Um, I think that it, um, to one extent it's a challenge to sort of get the players to sort of see uh, streaming as like this um, 
way to sort of talk to fans, way to get to know their fans better. Because obviously, you know, most of them are really young. They're like 17 or 18 years old. Um, and they really, you know, when they see... Um, when they when they go to events, for example, they really love the attention that the fans shower on them. They really like talking to mm-hmm. uh, talking to the guys. Even if it's you know the, these guys, uh, when I, in April I'd gone to the gone to the gaming house, um, and we had obviously uh, I'd met some of them for the first time. And you know, despite the fact that they had this language barrier, they still tried their best to sort of communicate. Um, and I think that's the same thing as well. It's just about you know, when you're at the age of being 17 or 18, you sort of just want to be playing the game a lot. You don't want to be, uh, you know, burdened with with other with other trivial activities such as streaming. Um, and I think that that's something which sort of comes with age. That you know, you, you eventually sort of understand. Okay, so for example, with with Nighten or Todd, uh, when we had him, it was more about sort of like, okay, you know what? I know that I have this fan base from Warcraft 3 uh, and I'm going to have these guys who are going to come back to see how I do in Starcraft 2 but uh, with players like Alive and Rain um, who've not had who've not been around for like any you know not been in either Warcraft 3 or Brood Wars competitively uh, for them it's a whole it's just a whole new game um, you know and I can understand it from my point of view when I see uh, streaming or when I see esports the way it's developing it's it's more from you know I ha- I have all this luggage from the from the previous years that I've spent in esports so I can sort of see that to me it seems logical that I should get these guys to stream but to the players since they've just it's a new scene for them it's a it's a whole new world literally for them mm-hmm. um you know, if I'm, they obviously do not see um the returns they do not see they don't they, in general they they be they're more interested in sort of just playing the game. So for us on Fnatic, it is definitely a, it's definitely a sort of challenge uh, to sort of uh, get the guys to sort of understand what exactly streaming means. Uh, mm-hmm. And Jeff obviously is really um, you know hit the hit the nail on the head when he said that it's about connecting with your fans and it's about uh, interacting with them. And um, I don't know how um, you know I I do not spend a lot of time on Reddit, but I do spend a lot of time on TL, as I'm sure everyone does over here. <laughs> yeah. um, and this is something we've noticed as well, that you know, a lot of times, even if the players are like really competitive, like Alive, for example, when he won IPL, there were a lot of people who said that, yeah, you know, Alive desi- uh, deserved to win that. Uh, but there were a lot of people who just couldn't care less, and they, they were just like, oh, you know what, he beat Nasty. Uh, yeah, I'm sure it's not. It's Terran Imba or whatever. Um, and I think that um, I think that because there's been so many. Okay, I'll just talk specifically in in Alive's case. Um, there's been so many so many Terran players in in Korea. Um, you know, until recently with the Zerg domination patch. <laughs> but you know, for so long there's been so many Terran players been in Code S that it's really hard for. I think for the fans to sort of distinguish between between different tiers of I mean they obviously everyone had loves their MMAs the MKP and the MKPs and uh, and the um the MVPs but then beyond this it's 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 sort of a challenge for Fnatic to sort of get people to sort of re- um recognize and realize that we have these talented players um so yeah it's it's not always easy um to sort of get players um to stream, I think it's uh, the, the guys who do that. It's really, really, um, it's really an asset for an organization to have someone who's really active in, in that sense. Um, and you know, similarly, there are pros and cons to both sides. So while my players might not stream, they're very extremely competitive. Mm-hmm. They can, they can, for example, in GSTL, we did really, really well. To a lot of people, it was surprising, but. Uh, having been there, having seen the guys stay, I could I can safely say I, I actually thought they would go into the playoffs as well. Um, but obviously, for whatever reason, uh, you know, we fell short at the end of it. We lost really closely to Sears, and mm-hmm. and you know, so yeah, I think that you know um, something which we will definitely see from our side at least, and something which as a manager I take on as a personal challenge is to sort of get our guys out there. And definitely, streaming is something which uh, you know guys can you know people can expect in the coming months yeah i'm, I'm gonna butt in there for a second and yeah, uh, sure. and, and talk and just talk about some of the things that elroy was was saying and he, he put some of it very nicely 
I, I truly believe that it's not streaming is not for everybody. Um, I, I think it takes a certain personality to do it. And we take a look at EG for for example. I mean, In Control is is probably the poster child for somebody that. Oh, I don't want to say something too bad here, but he, he's a poster child for, for being able to be a showman and, and be very successful in doing so. Um, and, he, and, you know, he, the whole, almost the whole EG team is like the way they pick their players, uh, marketing-wise, is they're, they're very, if they're not performing at their, at their best, they're at least still um, outperforming even the performing players in other aspects. So they're staying... Uh, in the front lines and, and in the spotlight for, for, for so long. And I, I think that, you know, even every major pro team, whether it's in League of Legends or, or StarCraft or whatever, uh, I think that they should at least have one player on the team that is going to be their, their, their front man, is going to be their poster boy, and is going to put the name out there for the team and for the sponsors and sort of have that connection uh, with, with the fans. Um, and I think EG does that very well. Uh, so, so kudos to them. That's just my my two thoughts. I don't think it's for everybody. Um, you know, some some Korean players do it do it flawlessly, do it great, um, and and others, you know, they they don't have a webcam. They they obviously can't speak English, so there's that that disconnect already between the between the players and the and the uh, and the fans. But uh, you know, I, I think that every player should at least try it once when when they're ready. But of course, there is that not wanting to show your builds sort of thing and and you got to also respect that as well because at the end of the day they got to perform in, in tournaments they don't they don't want to give away their build orders and sort of the things that they're working on okay this brings up a really good point i mean a really good kind of topic that we weren't originally going to discuss i think it's 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 uh it's good um what okay so we we've talked about like i guess you know having personalities and and just having players that are streaming and and, and it kind of brings up a good question as to is it harder to become a, you know, a top level player. I mean, a player that wins tournaments, you know, and and th thus, you know, you end up just inherently just getting like stream numbers. You know, you you could just like you were saying, Jeff. Like, you don't even have to have a camera. I mean, like DRG could just like just just show his play, and and you know, a couple thousand people watch him play. I mean, that's yeah. you know, just because he's DRG, right? Reaching yeah. that level, was it easier to do that, or is it easier to 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 do what you're doing, Jeff? Like, which is harder, in your opinion? Uh, well, I mean, I don't want to give myself a too big of a pat on the back, but mm -hmm. I, I think uh, I think both are, are almost as equally as hard. I mean, one one or the other is going to require you know ridiculous effort, like just diligent effort uh, to to get there. Uh, I'm still not where I want to be yet, so you know if I uh, trust me, I'm playing 40 hours of StarCraft a week, so I guess I'll say that being a top pro pro player is probably a little bit harder. But they both require um, tough, tough work from start to finish, and it's the same thing. You know, you can make a huge mistake as a personality that can ruin your whole career, um, and you can do the same uh, as a player as well. So I mean, there's a lot of the same hurdles. Uh, I think it, I think the journey is almost the same, but uh, once again, it, it takes a certain type of personality in a person. It takes a certain type of person to play StarCraft. 10 hours a day, 6 days a week, or move to Korea and give up your whole life and train to become the best in the world, as the same it would take for a, a person to quit their day job and, 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 and roll the dice on their life to become a personality. I mean, uh, it, it takes a, a special uh, person to be able to really put in the work to do, to do either one. Jeff, was there a time that you thought it wasn't worth it? Was there a time that you said to yourself, boy, we're not going anywhere with this? Um, you know, as you were going along, and then you're like, "Man, this is just not working out like we thought it was gonna." Yeah, um, I had a couple of a couple of small downfalls. Um, I, I don't want to say that I ever thought that this isn't gonna work, but I've had big disappointments in esports, and I almost told myself a couple of times that maybe this isn't worth it. You know, I lost faith in some some of the community uh, on some of the way that they've handled and acted about things. Uh, but I guess that's like that in anything in life. Uh, people are always going to try and put you down, try and ruin ruin things for everybody, and and so on and so forth. Um, I've I've definitely had my lows, but my highs have been so beyond the lows that no matter what, uh, we trucked through and we made it. So, and we're going to continue to keep doing so. Well, and again, I mean, <laughs> I, I always bring this up, and he's never here when I bring it up. And Mr. Bitter always talks about yeah. the fact that it it literally takes hard work. I mean, you can't just expect 
things to, to happen for you. I mean, for some people it has, uh, you know, just by association, they've gotten to know someone that was very popular and then all of a sudden they become popular. But uh, for the most part, it takes really hard work to continue to do this. I've been doing this for 12 years and, and uh, in eSports, and it's taken a long time to get to this point where I'm at, and I've got a long ways to go. I mean, if I want to be like Sundance, you know, I've got a long ways to go. But I don't no. want to be like Sundance, just to <laughs> clear that I, up. I know what you're saying. <laughs> You, know, you don't you don't like his you don't like to have hair is that the deal? <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, that I think he purposely fucking did that. I think he noticed that me, Mr. Scoots, and himself, the three old guys. He's actually not that old, but but three people have been in esports for a long time didn't have hair until so he's like, I'm just gonna grow out hair and just show those guys up because I can actually grow hair. <laughs> oh, man. I can't. That's funny, but um. Yeah, so getting, you know, kind of segmenting to the next point, um, so Jeff, you know, we, we definitely talk, you talked a little bit already about, you know, you kind of, you know, one of the things that, that kind of got really popular was your YouTube channel, yes. you know, with Lack TV and everything. I mean, there's a lot of folks just trying to, you know, trying to do that, right? I mean, obviously there are folks that are, you know, trying to do live streams, and then there are still folks still trying to work, um, you know, making videos, and there, you know, there's a ton of success stories, right, on, on YouTube, with just, um, you know, folks making a living off just making videos. Um, you know, I know you talked about, you know, you made some mistakes, you burned some bridges, and I think a lot of folks that are watching kind of know what you're talking about, so we won't rehash those. But um, what are some of, like, if you were to have it all over again, if you were to start over again, and, you know, you had content, you know, you had that kind of, um, when cheese fails, um, what, what are the best, I guess, tools for marketing you would use right now? Um... I don't regret a whole lot, let's put it that way, uh, because mm -hmm. when you make mistakes, you learn from them, and uh, you, do, you don't want to make them again. I'm, I'm happy that the mistakes that I made happened early on in my career, uh, so I could quickly learn from them and then sort of, you know, take a step back and get off my high horse for a minute and really look at myself, and, and I did that. Um, so getting on, your, getting on your question is, I'm a, I'm a big, big believer that first impressions are everything. And the only thing that I regret really doing is spreading the word about Lag TV so quickly. Uh, a lot of people ask me all the time, Jeff, I'm starting my own YouTube channel, my own stream, yada, yada, yada. How do I get noticed, you know? And the best way I can say it is, is hard work and just putting your soul and everything into it. Just do it with passion and try and be different than everybody else. And when it comes to networking, only promote yourself when you feel like you've, you've got your thing down. You don't want to have your first you know, StarCraft cast and post it on Reddit and have 30,000 people listen to it and it being the worst thing ever. And then people are like, I'm never going to you know, watch another this. I'm never going to look at this guy ever again. And I sort of regret doing that because I, I look back at some of the stuff that I was promoting and, I, and it makes me cringe. Um, thank, thankfully, the fans seen something in us that kept them watching. But uh, if I had to really say anything, is uh, networking only really network hard when you feel like you've got that one special thing. And to us, it was the when she fails for my stream. It's it's being connected, you know, being able to um, you know sing and dance and have fun and just be me, uh, and making sure that you have that. I'm not saying copy what I do or what. Uh, in control does or what uh, Dragon or Destiny does. You know, find your own thing that is unique to you and, and hopefully run with it. And you really just can't force it because sometimes it's just not meant to be. But go for it, you know. You only live once. Uh, I think Facebook and Twitter is definitely a must. You gotta, you gotta just constantly let your fans know. Because believe it or not, I love all you bosses and boss sets out there, but you guys are lazy. And if you don't, if you don't, you know, feed it to them, if you don't just put it in their mouth, like, you know, there's a new video out, look at it, um, you know, then they're not going to, they're not going to watch it. They're not going to search for it. You know, that's human nature. Mm -hmm. And also people don't like change. So try and stay the same because naturally, you know, if, if Facebook has a new patch and, oh, they got the timeline now and, oh, I hate that shit. I can't stand where the, you know, Facebook and Facebook, people are just going to hate change because it's something different. Uh, try and stay the same and keep all of your fans sort of in one place. 
Uh, and I think that's the best way to do it. You know, spoon feed them. Just keep going at it. Tell them, watch it, watch it, watch it. Yeah, that's, that's those are some really, really good. That's some really, really good advice. All that stuff that you just said there, because I, I've definitely, definitely experienced some of that too. <laughs> where it's just like the first shows, you, you gotta watch the first shows over again. And you're just like, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, obviously you're promoting it then. So the first impressions, I think, was like, you know, that's an awesome piece of advice to give everybody. And uh, yeah, like you said with the channels too. I mean, I think, I think everybody that has any kind of content, is, like, totally res, you know, can like that totally resonates with everybody so good stuff good stuff um john you're about to say something no oh okay you want me to oh, say I, th something? I thought you were i thought you were saying something i cut you <laughs> off sorry about that <laughs> no um, no it's okay uh let's see jeff um you know you know, you know obviously this doesn't really come up too often i, I, know, I know with you but um we, we thought that it might be interesting to see if you if there are there any challenges that have arisen along the way that have dealt with your you know, that dealt with your race, especially in StarCraft 2? Because we don't see many, you know, African-Americans in StarCraft 2, right? Yeah. Um, obviously, o other games you we do, but... You don't see it much in PC gaming, period. Yeah, yeah console uh, you do, but not, yeah. That's true. I, did a, I did an interview uh, at NASL with uh, Esports Canada, and uh, we actually talked quite a bit about uh, me being black and uh, mm -hmm. being in esports and stuff like that. And uh, they, they had they had sort of this uh, similar questions, you know, uh, is there sort of hurdles that I had to had to get over uh, you know, being African American, and, and absolutely, uh, I'm not. I'm not, oh. not going to sit here and say, oh, you know, I'm black, so life is hard, because I, that's not. That's not the case. But you know, I've dealt with a lot of racism, um, a lot, uh, whether it's on forums, people sending me hate mail, uh, on my stream, uh, whatever it is. But you know, <laughs> uh, it's the internet, and uh, I have pretty thick skin. And you know, being black, you know, that's something that. Uh, I grew up with, obviously, and I've been dealing, and I've been, and I've been dealing with my entire life. You know, the very first time uh, a girl has ever taken me, taken me home to meet her parents. You know, the first thing that goes through my mind is, you know, what are they going to think? You know, me being black and all, um, and and, and it's, it's sort of the same thing with, with esports. And I, I thought about that in a great deal when I first started to become sort of in the mainstream light. Is you know, there's not a whole lot of black black players out there or black personalities that are really taking the initiative to. to to go out there and, and put their, put themselves out there, um, and it has it has its challenges, but it has its rewards as well because you know I, I stand out for one. Um, if sponsors need that minority check in there, you know I can <laughs> <laughs> quota. I, 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 I exactly. Got to get their got to get their quota. I can sort of sneak in there and do that that way. But all jokes aside, um, for the most part, people have been really really uh, supportive. Like I said, you know there is. Those assholes out there that, that want to poke fun and, 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 and do what they do, which is fine. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I've had so many emails <clears throat> from, from black people that uh, sent me saying, you know, you're an inspiration to uh, allowing me, not even in esports, but to, to uh, pursue a, 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 a television career or um, whatever it may be. Uh, to to sort of not be afraid and, and put yourself out there and you know getting emails like that from people really uh, put a smile on my face and really make it all worthwhile. But you know I really don't like to get uh, hung up on on being black sort of thing because you know uh, even being white or, or being um, uh, Asian or or, or whatever uh, we all sort of go through our, our own hurdles. Uh, it just so happens that there's not a lot of black players uh, in StarCraft. You know you see quite a bit in the in the fighting mm -hmm. the the Street Fighter and stuff like that. But you really don't see a whole lot of it in StarCraft. And to be perfectly honest, I don't know why, because I know there's a lot of uh, uh, black players out there. I've met a lot of them at, at MLGs and NASLs, and I've talked to them on my stream and on Facebook and everything else. It's just, um, I guess, the numbers are against us. Jeff, you're going to stick out like a sore thumb at QuakeCon. <laughs> I believe it. I'm almost oh, scared. I'm almost You're scared. Almost scared? Oh. Don't be scared. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and, and I have to wear a, 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 one of those cowboy hats, too. Yep, yep. <laughs> no, no, talk about standing out, man. <laughs> no, but that's cool. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it doesn't seem to be very, a, a a very prevalent issue, you know. Obviously, in StarCraft too. It's just, I was, you know, obviously we were just curious if, uh, you know, if, if it has come up in, in, well, in your experiences. Well, what, what I think is interesting is that race does play a part oh, in boy, StarCraft too, yeah. and that bothers the it bothers me big time, um, because it's <laughs> all about the Koreans versus the foreigners. So there's already a race issue and. It, I don't know. I I just wanted to bring it up because I wanted his. I, I wanted to hear what Jeff Jeff said about it, uh, because he's not, you know, uh, a Korean and he's 
you know, and he's black. Not Caucasian. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, not Caucasian. Yeah, exactly. So I just, it baffles me because there, I've never been in a community where race has played such a big part of it. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it, it doesn't, it's not a negative, it's not necessarily in a negative way, but it's just, it's prevalent. It's, it's always mentioned, you know, either they're Korean. Oh, if you're Korean and you're, you're instantly good at, at StarCraft two. And that is not always the case. Yeah. It, and, and I know we want to rise above the stereotypes and people will tune into events in which Stefano's playing or, or there's another foreigner, which doesn't make any sense to me. Neither. Why are we calling our, you know, our own countrymen foreigners? I don't get it, but, mm. um, where we want to, we want them to win. We want to see them be successful, um, and then of course the Koreans do end up winning everything. But still, the point is, is that why does that have to be the issue? You know? Yeah. Well, I mean yeah. that that form of racism that you're talking about is it's kind of different because it is. It's not. I mean, w we call them Koreans because. I mean, <laughs> it's it's well, we really. Call, I mean, that's I, what they are, I and mean, that's what I mean, the culture I, is over at there. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, should I mean, they should be called players, uh, yeah. and, sure. not they, and not really uh, Koreans, because uh, a lot of the time is. I mean, even even on my pro team, you know, mm. oh, you know, we're announcing that we're picking up a a, a new Korean. You know, mm. it's not like uh, we're we're picking up a new a new great player. It's oh, we got to throw in that Korean word because mm. you know they. Uh, we all know why, you know, uh, and I, I think right. that's sort of what John was getting at is, you know, I, I'm sure it's, it's not in a racist manner yeah, at all, it's, it's, but it's it's kind of sad that we're going to put, you know, the race in front of the person and the or player. The or the team, you know. Or I the mean, team, exactly. Yeah. Right. Instead yeah. of it being, um, you know, so-and-so, it, it should be fanatic whoever, you know, it should be about the team that they're part of because, uh, for me at least, that, that gears us more towards getting esports into more of a sports sort of thing where we can get more of a structure in place, but if we're always like, you know, this Korean and it's, uh, yeah, I don't know, it just annoys the crap out of me, sorry. Yeah, I mean, yeah. What, what, what do you think of that, Elroy, actually? I mean, obviously you, ha you, no. you have a few Korean players and you have a Korean house, yeah. right? So. Yeah. Um, I think as, from what I've seen in the in the in the past, at least with Warcraft 3, we had a lot of Korean players, and um, you know, yeah, I'm saying Korean. And there was there was there was a time in in Warcraft 3 when there was a sort of issue where Koreans were looked as at as mercenaries because they were joining uh, of you know, they were joining European teams, for example, for whatever you know for like a certain amount of pay. And obviously, we we know that um, there was a lot of um, money that sort of went in, and anyway, whatever. Uh, but aside from that, I have. There was never. There were obviously. There were obviously parts where the word Koreans were used as a generalized term, but it was never used as um, as a as a way like oh, oh the, a Korean. You know, I think the only place it was mentioned was in WCG, where you know th because everything is nationality based. Um, and then I we, you know, I think it starts from Brood Wars, where it's sort of uh, where the community is sort of looking at it as. You know this dichotomous world where there's the foreigners and there and you know, where the non-Koreans and the Koreans, the foreigners and the Koreans, uh, and I think that was used to uh, a great effect in the early tournaments in StarCraft 2, and you know now it goes as a um, as a storyline. This is how I feel it is. It's it's more about this entertainment factor that it started off with, where people always felt the, you know commentators felt the need to sort of pitch the Oh, a non-Korean has beat a Korean, and uh, yeah. it's just—it's just—it's escalated from there, and it's just going to continue because it's a storyline used all the time. It's like the WWF, uh, WWE, sorry, storylines that that come up with, uh, you know, where people are the good guys and the bad guys. So that sort of helps, maybe I guess, tournaments sell, you know, computer games. I guess I don't know. That's how I feel at least. I, I'm sure I, maybe I'm wrong, but th that's that's personally how I see. No, it. Uh, you're right. I mean, there's. Right. Yeah. There's been events in which we've it's been pitched, you know, um, where it's you know Europe versus North America or something like that. I mean, those are always fun things to tune into, and people kind of get up, uh, get excited for those things. Um, so th those sorts of things definitely happen to try to you know raise awareness or get more people tuned in. But um, anyway, I love the WWE reference. It was Good very. Nice. It was very yeah. nice. <laughs> there, was there's fun. certain organiz there's a, there's certain organizations in esports I call the WWE of esports. <laughs> I, I won't go there. That's uh, funny. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So uh, Jeff, so um, one other thing too I wanted to talk to you about is um, I think it's kind of been 
known that you know you, you obviously have this this whole concept of a um, of a troll kind of tip right or donation type of thing right and yeah. donations are obviously a big part I think of um, I, I guess revenue for your stream I mean not big part but some some revenue from your stream um, talk to us a little bit about that I mean I don't think you, you you know for sure you know obviously I watch your stream so I know you don't you never ask folks for for you know outright for donations right but you know these folks I mean I think you probably get the most most donations out of anybody right and like anybody's stream because you know your your fan base is just I mean that loyal like I mean you can look at I guess somebody you can compare to just uh, kind of an analogous personality would be like somebody like Destiny right and Destiny does get you know I think his share too but I don't even think it's at nearly at like your level so talk to us a little bit about that I mean is it just purely because you know, you're just such an awesome entertainer, and 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 you know, folks are just <coughs> generous. I mean, overly generous. Or, you um, know. well, I, I think I think there's a couple of factors. Um, for one, back in the day when I was a server, and this was sort of coming towards the end of my my serving days, and I knew that esports was just around the corner for me, and it was almost time to throw in the towel and GG out of that life. Mm -hmm. um, I had a I had a big table and a huge bill. And I should have I should have made like sixty or seventy dollar tip, and they ended up leaving one dollar and twenty one cents. And I had taken a picture of the receipt, and I had actually put it into a video on Lag TV, and I had posted on our Facebook page, and that was sort of the beginning of the donations. From there, uh, people started troll donating one dollar and twenty one cents uh, to my account, <laughs> and sort of when that happened. Um, what I did as a way of saying thank you is they would they would also put in a song uh, for me to play on my stream and so every time somebody sent in a donation uh, they would write a note on there saying whatever I wanted or whatever they wanted me to say on the stream dedicating it to myself or somebody else and then I would play and of course thank them for for the support um, and it just sort of uh, spiraled from there and it's just sort of became a, a regular thing uh, on my stream and you're right um, I've never ever asked anybody uh, for a donation, uh, it's just sort of been, I guess it's been a snowball effect. You know, once one person did it, uh, it just sort of kept it kept going uh, um, on and on. And, and basically, they've they've given me everything uh, th that I have today. You know, my my trips to MLGs, my uh, my gear, my monitors, um, e everything that I that I really needed. So I wasn't really paying much out of pocket. And once again, a uh, big shout out to my uh, my bosses and bossettes and the fellowship for being so supportive day in and day out. You make this job uh, very easy for me, and uh, you make it all worthwhile. And I love every single one of you. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. I mean, you guys are amazing. <laughs> I mean, just like you know, amazingly generous. And you yeah, know, I know I Jeff. Have, you know, go ahead, Jeff. I have uh, I have like you know. Sure, sure. Some days are maybe a lot. There was that day when I had a six thousand dollars worth of donations in one day. That's great. Um, and it was sort of spare of the moment. I guess I can quickly talk about it. Uh, I was hungry, and I asked the stream, "What should I? I do this often, you know. What should I go get for food?" And uh, that day they said, "Go get sushi." And just before I left, I had ordered the sushi. And just before I left, you know, usually I do this little spiel where uh, I dance on stream in a toga. And they all <laughs> dared me to go to the sushi place and pick it up in my toga. And I was like, I'm not doing that, guys. You know, uh, um, I don't have any shame in anything in life, but you know, I'm not going to go there and embarrass the hell out of myself. <laughs> and one person said, you know, dude, I'll give you 100 bucks to do it. And I was like, uh, no, I can't do it. And then another guy was like, I'll give you 50. And I was like, you know what, 150 bucks to go in a toga. <laughs> Why not? So I went in the toga, and when I came back, there was over 150 donation emails, which totaled to, to about six thousand dollars in one day. Um, and you know that that was uh, that was insane. I mean, it, it hit the front page of Reddit. Um, it, it was uh, it was overwhelming. You know, I was fighting mm -hmm. back some tears of joy <laughs> that day for sure. Yeah. Um, and that just goes to show. I mean, obviously, there's been a few members uh, that have been watching my stream that. You know, uh, might be doing very well for themselves <laughs> in life. Yeah. Uh, so they they kind of give uh, a, a lot more than the average person, which you know makes all the difference. But um, for the most part, the majority of my fans, whether they turn off their ad block, uh, whether they subscribe to my uh, my channel for the 4.99 a month, or whether they give me a troll donation uh, uh, once a month, uh, somebody's always doing their part, uh, or even just watching, somebody's always doing their part. 
uh, and I do appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely amazing. Like, yeah, again, I think by, f I, don't, I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but from, you know, I go to a lot of streams, and, and I think by far, yours, you know, your your fan base <laughs> is the most generous. By, by yeah, I, a lot of other mean. streams also don't uh, acknowledge and, and tell yeah, their fans true. out yeah. loud how much they're actually getting. Mm -hmm, that's um, true. And I think that they're, and I know of two personalities uh, that are doing extremely well from their community, uh, and have done very well, but they just choose not to acknowledge their fans and say thank you in a public forum the way I do. So, yeah, yes, right. you're right, I do well, but don't for a minute think other people aren't doing as well as I am. Right. Yeah, actually, I tuned into his uh, to to your stream the other day, and and literally for about ten minutes, all it was was thanking your fans and, and letting them know that you appreciate it. You were upfront and honest, and uh, it was refreshing to hear that. Um, you know, because transparency in esports is not there yet, uh, but it's nice to know that there are people out there that appreciate uh, what their fans are, are doing for them and then lets them know, okay, this is what is happening here. You know, this is, this is what I'm getting, and, and I really appreciate what you guys are doing. Thank you, and, and uh, you know, I never tell anybody how much I'm making per year or, or what my salary is because it's none of their business, but I do let my fans know, and I do this all the time, and you can ask them, and you can do whatever you want to do, but I always tell them that, guys, donations is not necessary. I'm doing well enough on my own. Uh, they do help, and I put your money towards great things and good things to help further my career, but uh, I'm doing well enough on my own. I can pay my own bills, but I do appreciate the support, and I do tell them that uh, daily. Uh, you know, it's funny because th this segment actually is a perfect lead, in John, to uh, to re you know really the the Kickstarter QuakeCon. Uh, project that you guys are, you know, the kind of fundraiser you guys are um, working together with, uh, J John and, and uh, Jeff here. Uh, why don't you, why don't you both of you talk about it a little bit, or John, why don't you talk about it, and then obviously Jeff, okay. you can chime in. Uh, well, CSN was asked to come back to to QuakeCon again. Last year we went there, we didn't get announced until the day of the event. Uh, we kind of talked our way into it and, and they said, well, sure, we'd love to have you guys come and organize, organize some events. And we ended up giving away probably $35,000 in prizing last year, uh, five complete PCs that were donated by AMD. Uh, we ran over 30 tournaments. And QuakeCon, I, I've been to almost every major event at, at some point and, and worked most of them. I very, very rarely do I just go to an event. But there is nothing like QuakeCon, and, and I know I'm speaking to about 800 um, StarCraft II fans, but there is really nothing like QuakeCon. Uh, the production value is, is, is excellent. They've been doing it for 18 years. And so we were asked to come back and do, do this again, but, you know, we're, we're st CSN is still very much a startup company, and, and I, for some reason people think that, you know, we must be handed $10 million in VC or something, uh, <laughs> and that's just not the case. So, y you know, obviously... We wanted to, to be able to offer QuakeCon an experience much better than we did last year. So, you know, we talked to, to Maximus a little bit about it, and he, and, and he seemed pretty excited about reaching out kind of to a new demographic. Uh, once again, he is going to stick out like a sore thumb. He's a StarCraft player. Um, he, he's not the same color as most of the people that are going to be there. Uh, he's got a lot more personality, I can tell you that, than a lot of people that were going to be there. But, but QuakeCon is a huge party. There's, there's lots of things that are being going on. I mean, he's going to fit right in in a lot of different ways. But uh, it was an opportunity for him to, uh, I think, to to step out and, and, and get to know some new people, which is what he's very good at. And then, obviously, I mean, there's no, there's no beating around the bush about it. Um, he brings, a, you know, a lot of, a, a huge fan base that are, are willing to support what he's doing. And by doing that, it's going to allow CSN and Maximus Black to do something different this year at QuakeCon and to do it without breaking the bank. Um, you know, there would be a lot of expenses to, to pull down all of, the, all of the staff members to help run all of the tournaments and, and, and hand out all the prizes and to do all the networking and to meet with all the, the sponsors. There's a lot of work involved. Uh, Maximus is already finding out that um, there's a lot of craziness going on before we get to QuakeCon, and there's a lot of things that have to be done. And so um, 
it, it, it's exciting for me to, to have him on board. And I'll be completely honest, I told Maximus the same thing. I really only had heard his name and didn't really know a lot about him. And Andrew, uh, who's very familiar with the, the StarCraft II scene, said, we've got, we've got to have Maximus. I mean, you know, if it's something he's interested in, we've got to bring him on board because uh, he's definitely going to help drive uh, this Kickstarter thing. And, and speaking of Kickstarter, it... Um, yeah, I'm going to bring it up real quick, guys. Uh, yeah, speaking of Kickstarter, I want to say... Oh, man, I, I, sh I could get in trouble for this, but... All right, so we announced our Kickstarter, and it was just after um, Chobo had announced his. And it was something we had already been planning, and then as soon as, and he was on the show, on this show, when he announced it, and I'm like, oh, shit. You know, he's going to announce his, he's going to get a big poll, it's going to be successful. Um, you know, that, w that could be good for us, but at the same time, it could be bad for us, because then they'll think we're just trying to, you know, to get money from people and, and do the same thing. It's all about, okay, the community just chips in and helps all of these people that can't seem to make it on their own, right? Uh, yeah, you have a black screen, by the way. Uh, yeah, they should see in a second. Sorry, guys. I was trying to add source, and it didn't work. So, so, so we announced our, our Kickstarter, and there was a lot of positive uh, feedback to begin with. Um, I did get one negative tweet, uh, tweet about it, and it came from Slasher. And, and I know I'm bringing his name up, and, I, and I'm probably going to get you know, trolled for this or you know, you know, some hate for this, but... He, he made a negative tweet that, you know, he couldn't believe it. It was worse than the Chobo. You know, why this is bad for esports, blah, blah, blah. And I immediately I thought, are you serious, dude? We picked you up from the airport at last year's QuakeCon. We gave you a place to hang out, blah, blah, blah. You knew, you know exactly the dedication that CSN put into that event. You know how hard that we worked, that some of our guys literally were up for 24 hours. Because it's a 24-hour land for three straight days. So we're, most of our tournaments are ran after 11 p.m. And I was thinking, you know, and I messaged him, and, and I told him what I thought, and I never got a reply back, and he's been pretty quiet since. I think, you know, I hope maybe he realized, you know, maybe I, you know, maybe I was jumping the gun a little bit. What is wrong with Kickstarter? What is wrong with reaching out to the community to help support a project um, or a cause that you feel is important for the community? There's nothing wrong with it. It's no different than getting $50 million in VC. Um, you know, MLG getting $50 million. Where's the $50 million gone? It's no different than EG reaching out to about 40 different sponsors to try to get them, you know, completely taken care of. There's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with what Jeff 